Hello and welcome to Lightning EV Talk, our podcast from Lightning E-Motors headquarters in Loveland, Colorado. I'm Dan Bennett, I'm the marketing manager, and today we're going to look at a topic which pretty much everybody thinks about when they're discussing electric vehicles, and that is the topic of emissions. We glibly describe our vehicles as zero emission vehicles, and we're going to investigate whether that's really true and what the, what the actual situation is. So let's start by defining two categories of emissions as applied to electric vehicles. The first category is greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases have a global impact, and that impact is climate change. We've all heard a lot about climate change recently. Global warming is the primary driver of many changes in climate in regions and globally. The primary greenhouse gas that we think of with electric vehicles is carbon dioxide, otherwise known as CO2. Carbon dioxide is an uh, inevitable result of burning fossil fuels, and so any time a vehicle operates using gasoline or diesel or propane or CNG, carbon dioxide is produced. So while methane is the fuel used in CNG and LNG-powered transportation, uh, it's usually not emitted, although there is some, uh, some opportunity for it to be vented at the fueling station. Other locations for methane emissions are more serious, such as um, natural gas extraction fields. The other main category of emissions are air quality pollutants. Air quality pollutants have a local impact, and that impact is on health and quality of life. And we do talk about human health, but actually any organisms, any uh, animals and plants living in urban areas are also impacted to the same extent that humans are. Um, but human impact of uh, air quality pollutants is very serious, especially in places with high pollution, such as uh, India, China, and parts of the USA. Uh, examples of air quality pollutants, there's NOx, which is a family of oxides of nitrogen. These, these are um, products of combustion in internal combustion engines. VOCs, which are volatile organic compounds. We'll come back to these later. And particulate matter, PM, which is tiny, tiny pieces, usually of carbon, but could be of other materials as well. So like I said, we describe our vehicles as zero emissions vehicles. Is that true, and what does it mean? One of our videos on YouTube refers to our vehicles as zero emissions, and I remember seeing a comment on there which rather grumpily said, displaced emissions. In other words, the person making the comment says, it, they're not really zero emission vehicles, are they? they, they the emissions come from somewhere else. They are merely displaced. As much as to say the emissions are just the same, they're just elsewhere than actually at the vehicle. Well, let's investigate if that's true and what the magnitude of it is. We'll start by considering a typical Lightning E-Motors electric vehicle, uh, such as our electric transit van, and we're going to consider it being operated in the state of California. Before we can look at the emissions profile of an electric vehicle, we have to look at what a gasoline vehicle might emit in terms of CO2 emissions. And the transit van comes from Ford with a gasoline engine in it. So let's have a look at how that performs in terms of CO2 emissions. The EPA, that's the United States Environmental Protection Agency, states that burning one gallon of gasoline produces 19.6 pounds of CO2. That's actually just the result of a straightforward chemical reaction. That is a pretty hard and, hard and fast number. Burning one US gallon of gasoline produces 19.6 pounds of CO2. The typical efficiency of the gasoline-powered transit van is about 15.7 miles to the gallon. In some applications, it's going to be worse, and maybe in other applications, it may be better. But let's just go with this number for now, 15.7 miles to the gallon. So let's imagine now that we're driving it for 100 miles. That's going to use 6.4 gallons. And with the EPA number in mind, that will produce 125 pounds of CO2. But that's not the whole story, because for a more accurate assessment of the CO2 emitted, we have to consider the well-to-wheels scenario. And that's been modeled for us according to a model called the GREET 2015 model, which allows an assessment of how much CO2 is emitted from the, uh, the mining, the extraction, the transportation, the refining, and the distribution of the gasoline, because all of that takes energy to do, and most of that generates CO2. That causes our value of 125 pounds of CO2 for driving 100 miles to be uprated to 150 pounds of CO2. 
So therefore, our gasoline reference vehicle, driven 100 miles, produces about 150 pounds of CO2. Now let's consider the electric vehicle. Start by considering it on the road. How much CO2 does it emit? The answer is zero pounds. Zero pounds of CO2. It truly is, in that respect, a zero emissions vehicle. That, of course, is not the end of the story. We also need to consider the source. We need to look at where that electrical power is coming from and whether any CO2 is emitted in its generation. So electric power generation may emit CO2 if it's using any fossil fuels, whether it's coal, natural gas, or oil, then CO2 will definitely be emitted when that electrical power is generated. However, there are sources of electric power generation which do not emit CO2. Those are most notably wind, solar, and hydroelectric, geothermal, and nuclear. All of these methods of generating electricity don't emit CO2. So in order to estimate how much CO2 is emitted on the generation of the electricity that you're using to charge your vehicle, you have to ask, what is the local grid mix? Let's start by looking at California. Going by data from 2018, California's grid mix is roughly 44%. Electrical generation comes from natural gas power stations. This is actually not a bad figure. Natural gas produces a lot less CO2 than coal generation does. So the more that coal can be taken out of the picture, the cleaner the generation is, even if you're using fossil fuels. Turns out that California has, at this point, no more coal generation at all. Most of the rest of California's generation comes from renewables. There's a lot of wind power, solar, and hydroelectric. California's grid mix is, in fact, one of the best in the nation with regard to uh, CO2 emissions. So that's good news when charging an electric vehicle in California. Let's see how that pans out. If you do the calculations, and I have, if you drive a lightning electric transit van for 100 miles in California, in other words, you've charged it in California, this results in 24 pounds of CO2 emitted from California's power stations. That is, if you average out the, the grid mix across the state. Now, that's 24 pounds of CO2. Remember, the gasoline vehicle emitted 150 pounds. So this is much, much better. So with regard to California, we can say, are the emissions displaced? Yes, indeed. We're not emitting CO2 from the vehicle, and we are indeed emitting CO2 from the power stations. However, that emission is much, much smaller than the gasoline engine would have emitted in a, a stock transit van. So going from 150 pounds of CO2 for 100 miles driven down to 24 is a stellar improvement. How come it's so much better? One word for that, efficiency. Efficiency is the measure of how much useful energy you get out of your engine for the amount of energy you put into it. Let's make a quick comparison. Gasoline and diesel engines are a mere 27 to 30 percent efficient. In other words, of the chemical energy that's in the fuel in the tank of that vehicle, only 27 to 30 percent of that energy gets turned into traction. In other words, moving the vehicle along the road. The rest of it turns into waste heat and most of it goes down the tailpipe. Okay, you can argue that you get a little bit of it back whenever you're using cabin heat to heat the vehicle, but generally that's a really tiny amount of the energy equation. So gasoline and diesel engines are inherently inefficient in terms of overall energy budget. An electric motor, however, runs at 85% efficiency, which is much, much better. In other words, the electric power that's in the electricity that goes into the motor, only 15% of that gets lost. The remaining 85% is ready to drive the vehicle along the road. So for 100 miles, you need a lot less energy into the vehicle than you, on an electric vehicle than you would on a gasoline or diesel vehicle. So we've highlighted California, and it's a very encouraging grid mix, which has a lot of renewables and a fair amount of natural gas. What about Colorado? Colorado is interesting to me because that's where we're based here in, at Lightning in Loveland. So let's have a look at Colorado as a state which isn't faring so well as California. But it's not the end of the story, as we'll see a little later on. So Colorado has a grid mix, which is a combination of natural gas and coal, 
which actually is the largest component of Colorado's um, generation. It probably comes from being situated just south of Wyoming, I would guess. There is a little bit of hydroelectric, and there are non-hydroelectric renewables. The renewables are actually very significant in Colorado. There's a lot of wind and some degree of solar. So how does that pan out when it comes to looking at CO2 emissions from our transit van running 100 miles? Well, if we do the math, we find that 100 miles in our electric vehicle in Colorado produces 87 pounds of CO2. Now, 87 is a lot worse than the 24 pounds of California. That's true. It's a lot better, though, than the 150 pounds of a gasoline vehicle. But it's still not stellar. And you'll find across the United States, state by state, that number will vary according to the local grid mix. Some states, you can certainly imagine, have a lot of coal, like in the, in the southeast, and they probably have even worse figures than 87 pounds. Other states may be closer to what uh, California is showing. For example, Oregon or Washington um, are sure to have a lot of hydroelectric power, for example, and that will improve their figure. However... Like I said, this is not the end of the story. Things are getting better. Since 2010, Colorado's renewable electricity net generation has more than tripled. In other words, the renewable piece has gone up by a factor of three over the last 12 years. And this is led by increased wind and solar. It accounted for 30% of the state's total generation in 2020. In 2020, coal-fired power plants provided 36% of Colorado's net generation, down from 68% in 2010. In other words, in just a decade, Colorado's reliance on coal has come down by nearly 50%. In other words, EV-related emissions are improving over time as the grid becomes greener. So even though your vehicle is already in operation, it's on the roads, you charge it, you drive it, you charge it, you drive it, the amount of CO2 emitted from power stations every time you charge your vehicle becomes less and less over time as coal-fired power stations are retired, greener technologies are, are implemented, and more renewables come online. So the CO2 story for your electric vehicle gets better without you having to do anything. So that's the story with CO2 emissions. They are indeed displaced, but they are always less and often much less than um, the emissions that a gasoline or diesel-powered vehicle would produce on the road. Let's turn our attention now to air quality emissions, and these also fall into two main categories. <laughs> and this is where I introduce a word of my own invention. It is the word smogogen. A smogogen is something which... Well, it's smogogenic. What does smog smogogenic mean? It means it generates smog. Um, it's a word which I have searched for on, um, on Google and found nothing. So I'm taking credit for inventing this word. So go ahead and start using it. So smogogens are emissions which produce urban smog. And they fall into two main categories. There's NOx, which I mentioned before, which is the family of nitrogen oxides, which are produced by internal combustion engines, especially when they have high compression ratios or high temperatures. And then there are VOCs, the volatile organic compounds. Gasoline evaporating, if you've done a gasoline spill, is a VOC. It's a volatile organic compound. But there are others. There are adhesives and there are solvents and so on, all of which can contribute to the VOC burden in the local atmosphere. The other main component of air quality pollution is particulate matter, known as PM. And um, examples of that are diesel soot, brake dust, and tire dust, all of which, of course, are associated with automotive transport. These are particularly um, insidious when it comes to human health because the particles are so, so tiny that you can't detect them unless you're using scientific equipment to look for them, and yet they go straight into your lungs and can cause damage there. And some of them are even small enough that they go through the lungs into the blood and cause damage in the brain. So particulate matter is a, a major concern for, for health. So let's wind up this discussion by looking at how a lightning electric vehicle uh, measures up in terms of air quality emissions. First of all, NOx, the oxides of nitrogen, any emitted by the vehicle? The answer is no, no NOx. 
Volatile organic compounds? Generally, no. However, I, I suggest there may be a little emission when the vehicle is new. After all, that new car smell may indeed be volatile organic compounds. Any diesel soot? No, obviously. Any brake dust? Well, here's the thing. The, the brakes on our light, lightning electric vehicles are the stock brakes as installed at the OEM factory. And so they do indeed generate brake dust. But we employ regenerative braking, which does most of the deceleration uh, under the control of the motor, which acts as a generator and captures energy by, um, by charging the batteries every time you slow down. That's regenerative braking. One side effect of regenerative braking is that you use the brakes a lot less than you normally would because most the slowing down is done for you simply by taking your foot off the accelerator pedal. So therefore, although brake dust is generated, it's much less because you're not using the brakes so much. Another side effect of that is the brake parts last a lot longer, so your maintenance is reduced. And finally, tire dust. Do our vehicles emit tire dust? Well, yes, our vehicles emit tire dust. And you could argue that with the, the way our vehicles pick up from a standstill, there may even be slightly more tire dust than normal, depending on, on who's driving. But overall, the picture of emissions for uh, our electric vehicles, which we can validly call zero emission vehicles because we're broadly talking about CO2, NOx and VOCs and diesel soot on the road, you can call it zero emission. There's a little bit of particulate matter coming from the tires and the brakes, but other than that, they're pretty clean. So hopefully that has given you a picture of how a lightning electric vehicle fares in terms of emissions and that the story is actually really, really good um, and is getting better all the time as uh, coal generation is retired and more renewable generation comes online. So go ahead and enjoy your electric vehicles and know that you are doing something good, not just for the local environment, but also globally. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.